once again, a warm welcome to you to our webinar, Strategy, Performance and Market Update. Stefan, Thomas and Patrick, it's great to have you all with me. And before we begin, um, I have a few words about the technical setup. So it will take approximately um, 45 to 60 minutes. And regarding questions, just feel free to ask them in the chat. Um, the chat is public, so all your asked questions will be um, visible to all other attendees as well. Um, and Niklas from the Selma team will answer them. And if you have more personal questions, just feel free to also write us in the Selma chat um, on selma.com. These questions will be answered by our experts the upcoming days. So just in case that you that you know that. If we can't answer all the questions during the webinar, we will follow up by email later. So we'd like to introduce ourselves briefly and I will start. I'm Michelle. When I'm not hosting a webinar with three financial experts, I work as a social media and event manager at Selma. Thomas, may yes, I pass the Thank you, Michelle, you? and welcome to everyone also from my side. Great to have you here. Uh, I'm the customer success manager at Selma. Maybe some of you have already had contact with me uh, via the chat or email or even maybe a phone call. Uh, happy to help all our clients with questions related to investing and especially long-term investing. I've been more than 25 years in the financial industry and I have to say my passion is about uh, long-term investing and I hope to share all this knowledge with you. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Thomas. And then it's your turn, Stefan. Thank you. So my name is uh, Stefan, Stefan Jacklin. I am uh, a little bit like you and a little bit like the other three persons. Uh, it means that uh, I'm like you. I'm, a, I'm actually as well a client of uh, Selma. Uh, and I'm a little bit like the three of them because I've been helping them from the very, very start to develop the investment logic behind Selma. That's uh, kind of the topic. Uh, the reason for that is uh, it's been something that uh, has really been uh, my interest, also my academic interest for a long time, uh, because I fe feel that there is a, a lot of systematics that gets lost in uh, normal services and that I really wanted to bring into Selma. Perfect. So nice to have you with us too. And then last but not least, Patrick. Uh, yes, my name is Patrick. I'm uh, the CEO and one of the founders of Selma. I'm also a little bit uh, that, that originally the banker of the team. So I'm a, a trained and learned financial analyst. I don't have as much experience as the other uh, two guys here. It's like uh, around 15 years that I've been in the, in the financial industry uh, so far. Uh, I'm apart from being a CEO of Selma and the founder of it, I'm also being responsible for our investment strategy uh, together with, with Stefan also in the in the early days Stefan actually wrote his PhD about um, uh, his, our investment strategy so it's uh, like, he doesn't like to mention it but it's it's true so or we used his PhD for our investment strategy and I think that that's what we're gonna um, talk about tonight uh, wh what is our strategy um, how did it work in the past why um, uh, do we have the investment philosophy we have and then um, I I'd also like to share some personal learnings that I had in my uh, investment career. Really nice. Perfect. So then we can go on to the next slide. This is the um, agenda for today. So today we have four parts. Um, first, we will decode the investing performance or investment performance. Then we will go on with the Selma or Mitzelva's investment st strategy. Next, um, a financial market recap, and then we will finish with Selma's performance, so a bit more a hands-on topic. Important to know, um, today's webinar is only about our investment account and not about our Pillar 3a account. Just keep that in mind during our webinar and when making your comparison. So let's dive right into the first part. Let's decode investment performance together with you, Patrick. Happy to do so. <laughs> yeah. 
So um, yes, uh, some of you might have seen that recently we've also published an article about this, and this is all about um, uh, performance, investment performance, and what you need to keep in mind if you compare um, different uh, different things with with each other and compare the investment performance. Either if you compare Selma with something else, but also if you compare other um, other investments to each other. And um, what I brought here tonight are some of the most important uh, topics that uh, are also pitfalls that we often see uh, that I wanted to illustrate with a few uh, few examples. So happy to hear all the pitfalls. Then. Yeah, maybe not all of them. There are also some of them that I will um, uh, that we left out, but there is a few that are um, very important. Um, first, investment performance. So we talk a lot about the performance, which means the return, how much you earn or how much you lose. And uh, it's very important that this return always uh, is also connected to a risk uh, you have. And the example that I always um, tell is the one, let's say, okay, you make an investment today and then the, tomorrow it doubles and the day later on it halves again. So that means two days after you have the same amount than you have now. Um, so you could be tempted to compare that with your savings account where you also don't earn any money in two days. You also have the same um, same amount in two days, uh, but the, uh, basically the emotional roller coaster that brought you there and the development is completely different because one day you have doubled and the other uh, day you have have lost half of it. And uh, what we have here is a comparison um, of the S&P 500. That's the blue line. That's the 500 largest companies and their development um, in the last uh, one and a half years. And then uh, the, the yellow line, that's the, the Bitcoin uh, and how that has developed. And you could think the S&P 500 as a stock market looks pretty flat right compared to the to the bitcoin it isn't that flat when you take another kind of uh, kind of chart but you can see that even though in the end you have made exactly the same return so um here uh, I'll adjust uh, a little bit under um under 15% dish uh, you you can see right that what brought you there is a different kind of journey and with the bitcoin you had parts where you have lost a third of your entire investment. So if you had invested 100,000 Swiss francs, you would have lost 33,000 pretty much in the beginning of the, of the journey. You would have used much more nerves. And uh, what is important for the comparison is that when you look at investment, that always when you take a higher risk, it should also come with a higher return. So here, basically, if you compare that, um, the Bitcoin has been worth of an investment has been the, uh, delivering the same return, but with a much higher risk and much more of a, a roller coaster. And this kind of fluctuations, that's how you measure risk in, um, uh, in the financial sense. So when you look at two different investments, always keep that risk in mind. Then uh, second um, very important uh, part or uh, point that I would like to make is the, is the timing. And uh, timing, that means uh, comparing things short term uh, versus long term. I also mean with that if you compare two different things, you need to use first. Uh, you should use the same period. So you cannot compare an investment that you held for half a year with something that you held for five or for um, 10 years. Um, and often if you just take a short period, it doesn't tell the entire story. So what I brought here is um, an example of, of Zoom. Zoom, uh, a provider, you might have gotten to know them during the pandemic. There were a lot of calls and discussions that happened over Zoom instead of being uh, in, in a room. So. Um, uh, uh, you can see that when the pandemic started, uh, this looked like an excellent investment. You made a lot of money with that. Uh, then later on, if you take just another, just half a year of that chart, it looks completely different, right? So if you take the other, uh, the other part uh, of that chart, when you go into 2022, uh, it's been a very bad investment. 
And um, so often just a fraction of the timeline doesn't tell the whole story about an investment. So our advice is compare as long as you can um, if you have different investment, take like go as far as you can get. Ideally, you compare over 10 years, even better over 20, because then you have different cycles, different economic cycles, different interest rates, different um, uh, uh, different market environments. And when you look at that, then you can actually say something about the quality of an investment instead of just taking out one single period where something might have just worked very well because um, uh, because the market was favorable for that investment in uh, in that time. So third point that goes a little bit into another direction, and that's the cost. So uh, a cost uh, is a very important factor in investment, especially over time. Um, when you compare different investments, uh, make sure uh, you, you compare them either with or without costs. At Selma, we, we show you all the performances, including all the costs, so net Net, net, that means um, the loss or, or the gain we show um, already includes everything that you have paid. Not all providers do that. Uh, it's also a speciality of some providers that um, uh, they add extra costs here and there on the account, on the trading, on like, uh, yeah. We've seen weird things there, but um, just when you compare performance, make sure that you also look at, at the cost. There are other factors that are also important, like that you compare things in the same currency. You can't compare something that is in dollar to something that is in Swiss francs. You need to like adjust for that. Uh, but those things we've also, as mentioned, written down in an article to, to um, basically put the spotlight on all those points that are important when you think about performance. Uh, if Niklas is not busy in the chat, I don't know, you can ask him for the link and then um, I'm uh, sure he's happy to, to share the article that uh, we've written about performance. But that's all for a start from the maybe more a bit theoretical side. And now I think we can um, dive into, um, into yeah, what, what we do and what we think at Selma. Perfect. Thank you, Patrick. Um, so Stefan, when it comes to Selma's investment strategy, we have like the ideal person in the webinar with you to explain it to us. Um, you as one of the minds behind uh -huh. it. So um, as we heard, it was your PhD. Are you in the mood to tell us a bit about your PhD? <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, delighted, in fact. Uh, I think, uh, you know, the very first starting point of an investment strategy is certainly to think through your philosophy first, before you dig into deeper. Uh, and one of the key elements of an investment strategy is really actually to first agree on the horizon that you have. And uh, Selma is there to help you accumulate wealth over time and over an extended period of time, because that's what you save money for. You don't save money for uh, the lunch in the afternoon tomorrow or, uh, you know, the week after. You save money for the longer term. And this is why uh, a long term perspective uh, and to see this as a philosophical uh, element in it is really key. So, so that's number one. Number two is uh, money flows extremely quickly in nanoseconds across the world. Uh, how does it do it? Well, electronically, uh, you can execute trades all over the world in absolutely no time. Um, and there are many people doing that and many smart people, but millions of people. And what happens is money will go wherever there is an interesting opportunity. Hence, restricting yourself to what you know, like little Switzerland, is just not a good investment approach because that ignores that smart money goes everywhere. And this is why the global aspect and the diversification across geographies, across many different asset classes, is really a key element for a good portfolio. And then come two points that I have really nothing to do with the world outside, but with your own world. 
which is your own financial situation. Because everyone amongst you has a different environment, different possibility, different concerns. You know, the whole, the whole life plan, financial resources, etc., are different. What Selma really does is it constructs a portfolio that is for you. That means Patrick's portfolio that he has on Selma is actually very different to mine. Mine is different from, from Michelle's or, or from Thomas's and from each of yours because I am different and so are you. Uh, so what do we do? Well, we tailor the risk of the portfolio to your ability and to your willingness to absorb risks. So what are we not doing? We are definitely not there for speculation. It's not a casino. Selma is not a casino. That means also we're not going to make you quickly rich. But guess what? The nice thing is you're also not going to get quickly poor, which is, as you know, more likely in a casino than the opposite. And we do not put specific focus on individual companies, markets, or industries. So we don't do all that talking about the selection of this jumping forth and back. Why? Well, because precisely money is so quick and so efficient that all science indicates that the likelihood that you're just wasting money in transaction costs is much, much higher when you chase behind those things. So what do we do? In a first step, we design a global market portfolio. And why do we take that global market portfolio? Well, we take that because that's where global smart money flows into. And that indicates to us that it is actually an interesting market. It's also helping us in designing a very efficient portfolio. And that means it's a portfolio where actually for a given amount of return, the risk is minimized. So it's, it's, it's really trying to balance effect efficiently off risk and returns. That's what an efficient portfolio is. And maybe, so one question, um, why is the global portfolio like the most efficient ah, one? Yeah, it is, it is the most efficient. Um, there's, uh, there are very few Nobel Prize winners in finance. Very, very few. And you know what? Because a lot of what's done in finance is not scientific. The most important Nobel Prize winner in finance, probably Harry Markowitz. And he actually won it because precisely he showed that when money is free, it expands into, it's like water. It goes wherever there are holes, wherever it can fill something, and it fills it. And if it's no longer there, no longer attractive, it immediately flows out. So that means that mass these trillions, trillions of very smart money make the money, the market highly efficient, which means it actually makes sure that those prices uh, uh, that are paid in a global market uh, create what you can say that efficient portfolio that gives the highest amount of return for a given amount of risk. Perfect, thank you. Now, we move to step number two. Now, Harry Markowitz won his prize because that was phenomenal at the time and people realized that there is actually science between, behind portfolio construction and not just, uh, you know, kind of bogus and, uh, you know, hot talking. So there's science. What is the second? absolutely academic proven element in finance. There are not many. The second is that there is actually a mean reversion. What that means is prices do over time come back to an average level that is deemed 
you know, appropriate, that is deemed fair. Uh, or in other words, you have periods of overvaluation and periods of undervaluation. But over time, this does come back to an average and it adjusts itself again. These are these long cycles that you've certainly heard of. Uh, the difficult thing is, and there's no science proof for that, is to actually figure out when exactly the markets are back. That is incredibly hard, if not impossible to say. But because we know that the second proven thing next to diversification and the efficient portfolio is this mean reversion, it's reversion to, an, to, to a normal price, we are overweighting in our portfolio asset classes that have moved too far and significantly far away from what their average reasonable pricing should be. And uh, we are we are over sorry we are overweighting those because we know over time those prices when they are too much below that average they will come back, and we are underweighting where prices are too high, way too far off from what their fair long term price ratio should be. And this is uh, something that we do on a quarterly basis. We're reviewing the information in the market and adjust the portfolios accordingly. Perfect. Sorry, that was my question. <laughs> but you already answered it. Okay, perfect. Uh, Sorry for interrupting. Sure. So let's move, uh, let, let, let's move on. Um, the the one element that you also need to take into account is that there are and can be and have been we've witnessed this some there can be very unusual moments moments of war moments of huge crisis and in all of those moments the one thing that absolutely suffers always are financial instruments Shares, bonds, they don't like that at all. That's not a good environment for them. The one thing that has always worked, and when I talk always, I literally mean always. I mean, you can go back about 4,000 years. It has always worked. In major crises, precious metals do work. They normally, are not very attractive because they don't generate returns. They don't generate dividends, no interest rates, no nothing. But hey, if a major crisis hits, that's the one thing that helps you. So what we have in our portfolios are also a smaller element. It's not a huge element, but it's a smaller element, protective element that uh, helps you to navigate through major disruptions. Let's uh, move on, please. Now, what is the result out of this? The result out of this is a portfolio that consists of three elements. The first element is a growth element in your portfolio. The growth element includes companies that we you know that should be growing over time you know all international companies loans to companies international real estate swiss companies private equity so businesses that you know their whole orientation their whole focus is growth so we want those in the portfolio Now, I'm not sure, Stefan, um, we lost the connection. So maybe you can start again with your last sentence. We might have lost. Oh, I, I am back. There you are. Okay. 
I am back. I don't know why, but that's the magic of uh, uh, of IT. Um, so we've got the stability elements that make sure that your portfolio in regular uh, fluctuations helps is, is stabilized. That's loans to countries, Swiss real estate. Uh, you know, that's the elements that provide stability. And then we have, as I said before, we have the crisis protection, which is a layer of uh, uh, precious metals. So this is the structure. Now, I have to repeat myself at this point. That explains how your portfolio is constructed. But your own financial situation and your risk aversion now will matter greatly in determining the weight of the different elements that enter your portfolio. So again, Selma is probably the only service out there uh, that actually doesn't use a model portfolio where we all sit in five different portfolio clusters. No, each one of us has his own custom tailored portfolio, but that consists out of those elements that uh, we have outlined here. Perfect. So I hope you can hear me, maybe not see, but hear me. Okay, that's perfect. <laughs> now the IT um, virus came to me. Thanks, Stefan. But uh, thank you for your talk. It was super insightful. And I think we can move on with part three. Um, so let's do the financial market recap. As Selma's customer success manager, um, you are answering a lot of questions regarding market happenings, Thomas. So what do we need to know in your eyes? Yes, thank you, Michelle. And welcome once more from my side. Well, first of all, maybe to recap what Stefan said, I think this was very, very important what he said. So to give an insight about how to invest, to invest in a globally diversified portfolio, uh, that's something that we very often tell our clients where they, they ask us, uh, does this make sense? Yes, it does make sense. I think Stefan uh, just outlined what is the theory behind it and the theory also is proven to work over long term. And this, of course, is again, the very basic word when, in, when thinking about investing, to think long term. Uh, we at Selma, we say, ideally you should invest at least for 10 years. Of course you can uh, also maybe have a shorter invest in, uh, in investment horizon, but ideally you should invest for more than 10 years, even longer. Think in not in months, not in years, think in decades uh, when, when investing money. Now, of course, uh, many of you, they have been our clients now for two, three years, uh, maybe even shorter. And of course, long-term uh, investing does make a lot of sense. Short-term, it can be a little bit of a roller coaster. And we have seen that during the last two years. Uh, there are reasons for that, uh, reasons that we want to mention now, just to keep it also a little bit in the perspective, what has happened and in what kind of environment uh, people are investing currently. Uh, we all remember there is a war in Ukraine. It started in February 2023, uh, 2022, when Russia invaded Ukraine. Uh, it's a human tragedy there, of course, uh, no doubt about that. It caused also a lot of economic uncertainty, actually worldwide. We have seen an energy crisis. We have seen rising prices, high inflation. Everybody of us has seen that on, on, on the day-to-day -day life, the prices are going up. Uh, in some countries more, in some countries less, but prices have moved up actually quite considerably over the last years, over the last two years. That's actually also something that we thought we would never see again. Or if we, I think the, the financial industry or people out there thought that uh, in a globalized world, we might have, uh, we might see the end to inflation. But now actually with the crisis in Ukraine, with rising energy prices, inflation has come back it has come back with a vengeance it has come back very strong and this also means that central banks have to react to that we all remember for the last 15 years central banks they had even negative interest rates nobody got uh, an interest on a bank account uh, uh, 
and you even have to pay negative interest rates. Now, in order to fight inflation, central banks have to rise interest rates. And actually, they have to do that quite considerably. And maybe one question, and um, what do you think? Where we, where are yes, we on actually, this chart right now? Yes, actually, that's a very interesting right question, it's Michelle. Nice, yes, uh, maybe to explain this a little chart. bit. Here on the left side on this chart, you can see basically the emotional cycle that many investors have to go through when seeing times like this. So, and this is also something that repeats itself. Actually, I've been 25 years in the financial industry and there was plenty of crises I had to witness and were, was able to witness. And basically it always goes more or less in the same way. First of all, things look fine. We are in the green area there. Things look fine. Everybody's excited. Everybody wants to invest. Eventually the market turns. Things happen. There might be some uh, cat cat catalyst for that, uh, be it a war, be it other financial crisis, be it uh, uh, the debt crisis in Europe, whatever it was, then things go down. And then eventually you think, well, maybe I sit it out, it doesn't have it, it won't last that long. Then you panic and you are in this red area. And quite often it might happen that uh when you panic then this is actually close to the to, to the bottom of the market and then things recover again they trend, tend to recover still there is uncertainty there and most of the time you would even miss the situation where you miss the time the perfect time when you have to when you want to reinvest again so i think we are definitely still in this red area it's difficult to say whether we are on the left side of the red area so if things can still get a little bit worse or if we are already in a recovering phase, that could also happen. Markets can recover actually much earlier than what we see on a day-to-day -day life, what we experience in the day-to-day -day life, because markets, they tend to anticipate. They think at least half a year forward. So I think we are in the right area. The most important thing is to remember, this is a normal cycle that can happen. This is an emotional cycle and it is repetitive. When you invest money long term, you probably have a chance of visiting more than one crisis. Uh, however, as uh, Stefan also said uh, in his part of the, of the presentation, things tend to recover eventually. And when you look long term, then this is actually the best way to, to, to sit it out. Coming back to interest rates, uh, here you see a chart on the right hand side. Uh, what you see there is actually the, the five year interest rate for the, for the US market. So this is more or less the benchmark uh, for global investing. That's what global investors follow when they talk about the interest rates. Uh, and uh, you can see uh, in 2007, they were actually pretty high. Then came the financial crisis, interest rates were down. They went down actually quite a lot. Then they recovered again, then came COVID and a very strong response by, by, by global uh, central banks making money very cheap, meaning interest rates were uh, lowered, they, were gone down to, they have gone down to zero actually for a prolonged time, they have been even in the negative. Then came the Ukraine war and as we said, with higher inflation, central banks had to dramatically change their policy and increase very, very significantly and rapidly interest rates to a level that we haven't seen for the last 15 years. Actually, in the financial industry, people are talking about in, an interest rate shock. And as I said, this is due to the, to the, to the end of the, of the negative interest rate policy by, by global central banks. The good news here is that actually with higher interest rates, looking forward, well, that of course also means that, for example, certain certain uh, investments that are tied to interest rates, well, they can actually uh, earn you higher interest rates uh, returns. That's actually the good thing about it. However, in the short term, higher interest rates, they do have an impact on the prices of bonds or loans to companies, loans to countries, as we call it in your Selma portfolio. Higher interest rates means that market prices of existing bonds go lower and vice versa. Should interest rates go lower, then bond prices go higher again. So they affect uh, the market price of your current investments, but looking forward, higher interest rate earnings 
uh, are of course also uh, the, the the name of the game when when interest rates are uh, are rising by the central banks. Saying that, bonds they can be an important part of a diversified and long term portfolio in case it fits to your investor profile. Of course, it has to fit your investor profile. This is what Selma checks out. Whenever you update your profile, uh, your investor profile at Selma, Selma would check whether your, your investments, your long-term investments should be adjusted as well, whether there should be bonds included or not. Here you can actually see this relationship even, even maybe a little bit clearer. Uh, on the left side, you see the, 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 the interest rate set by the Swiss National Bank. Again, we have seen a, quite a prolonged negative interest rate environment. So interest rates were below zero. Uh, actually, they were zero spot seven, minus uh, zero spot 75 for a prolonged period of time. And then at the beginning of 2022, with inflation starting to rise, and especially after the outbreak of the war in Ukraine, also the Swiss central bank has raised interest rates quite dramatically and quite fast. On the right hand side, you see the effect on bond prices. So what you see there in the orange chart is like the price development of a basket of bonds in Switzerland. And you can see once interest rates are going higher, the market price of those bonds is going lower. What you should also remember with bonds, of course, is that this is money that you loan to somebody. You loan it to a company, you loan it to a government. And in the end of the term of the loan, so once it matures, that money has to be paid back. And there, of course, with Selma, you, have, uh, you, you loan the money to very strong companies, you loan the money to very strong governments. So the likelihood that that money is paid back is, of course, very high. And this is also why bond prices tend to recover when they approach the maturity. Thomas, I need to, I have to ask, um, would it be wise um, to buy now many bonds because like interest rates are rising or is this exactly the wrong strategy? I'm not strategy? sure if it's wise to buy more bonds or less bonds. This is something that definitely depends on your investor profile, on your financial ability, on your willingness towards risk. And of course, also on your investment horizon, if you have, uh, and uh, so if all that fits well, if you have all of that in a very, very strong manner, you have a long investment horizon, you have a very strong financial situation, and you have a, a, a very high willingness towards risk, it might make sense not to have bonds at all. Because then, of course, it's better to just have as much growth in your investments as possible because over, over time they can offer even a higher return than bond investments. For another uh, portfolio, a broadly diversified portfolio that fits your investor profile, and that is also long, uh, that is also long term, uh, bonds can have a very interesting uh, contribution to your, to your overall investment returns. And now that interest rates have gone higher, of course, they are even more attractive. But the question whether you should have it in your portfolio or not, this is actually a question that answers Selma on your behalf. This is what Selma is for. Go and update your investor profile and Selma will tell you about it. Perfect. That sounds good. So uh, no need to worry about that and by myself. Perfect. <laughs> um, thanks, Thomas, for your part. Um, now we're already um, at part four. Um, so let's get practical again um, with you, Patrick and Selma's investment or Selma's performance. Yes, I think we are already pretty practical when you talk about the bond prices and so on. But let's now uh, look look into um, yeah, how did Selma do and, and how does it compare and, and how does it look like? Uh, what, what I need to um, tell first, I also looked at some of the of the names here in the webinar, some I recognize from the early Selma days that are customers for already for like a, a longer period of time. There are some names, some people that have just started. Some people have in, uh, started with one sum, some people they invest. Uh, over time, a part of their salary. So, and and obviously, as as you said, um, Stefan, all the portfolios are individual. So I cannot really comment on somebody's individual um, uh, portfolio here. But what I would like to give is an an impression in general how uh, well, how did Selma do, and basically to give you a representation of um, how did Selma compare. 
to um, also other uh, other markets. And um, first here, what we're looking at is at the comparison of a global uh, portfolio. And as we heard, the global uh, portfolio, that would be a representation of what Selma does. Um, so basically the, the, the stocks uh, or the, the equity part that Selma has, and we have compared that uh, with the Swiss. Uh, portfolio and why have we compared it with the Swiss portfolio because um, first the Swiss portfolio is something that is very close to many of our um, customers it's what happens here we are in, in Switzerland it's also that uh, maybe some of our let's say um, peers slash competitors and so on in the digital space they have um, pretty heavily invested uh, into Switzerland so um, if you do a comparison between Selma and maybe another um, uh, another provider in Switzerland this is what we would often get compared um, with. So looking at um, the last um, around two years, here you can see that the global portfolio has um, pretty much moved um, up and down uh, in the beginning with Together with, with, with Switzerland, you can also see that uh, basically uh, if you have started from the uh, end of 2021, uh, you would have seen a period where you would have been in constant losses over, over time. So um, uh, uh, you, you have not really had um, a recovery. There was a recovery in between in um, the Swiss stock market. Uh, and I think now looking at Thomas, right, that's also when you get comments and uh, maybe also questions why is, uh, why is Selma not performing as strong as the, um, as the Swiss uh, market here. Now this um, uh, has closed again. So when we now look around the last two years back, we are basically at the same uh, performance here of an international compared to a Swiss, um, uh, Swiss portfolio. But maybe like one question and it to me, it seems like a Swiss portfolio could also be like a good option and might feel much safer and even closer to me. So why do you recommend this international portfolio? Or global portfolio. It's an excellent question. So um, first, what I would like to look at is maybe let's do the same comparison, but let's look at it over a longer perspective. So if you uh, remember when I talked about um, performance comparison, I said that maybe I should look at the longer horizon um, and, and compare things not uh, in, in financial markets those two years. It's a really short uh, period still. It's it's almost like <laughs> like like luck. What could be better? What could be worse? Right. So when we look at comparisons, we really should look at a, at a longer perspective. So let's look at that first. So, um, and here on the on the right side, you can see the same comparison that we had before, but not over two years, but over um, uh, ten years. You can see there are some periods where um, the, the Swiss uh, portfolio performed better. There are some periods here in like um, seventeen eighteen where the um, international portfolio um, uh, performed better, and it's been a close race with one of the two like being being ahead or being behind. And basically, we see the same here also over ten years years pretty much like same result right so same um uh, same return uh, and i know that hasn't answered your question yet <laughs> i think at least and i'm sorry but i'm getting to it and um there are two parts here so Number one is what um, Stefan, I think, has very nicely described with um, the money flowing internationally and going to different opportunities. So you might um, restrict opportunities when you restrict your money just to, to Switzerland, right? So um, uh, because there is much more, there are other economies that have um, much higher growth. There are some issues with, uh, with Europe and the growth rates we're seeing here. There are other economies where you can profit but that's not the only part i think the even stronger argument for me is the is the risk um side and um uh, given that um uh, switzerland is like uh is a, a, a sensational country i have to say that that's a proud swiss so but uh, um also looking at um how you're invested and now when i say how you're invested um i mean 
I mean, you also, Michel, as, as an employee of Selma, you have a, a, a pensions casse, you have um, uh, potentially a pillar 3A that you have invested. And the pension money usually tends to be invested very, very strongly into Switzerland. And that uh, historically, because there is a law, it's called the BVV2, it's the law how um, uh, pension money can be invested. And it had also historically a division between um, domestic, so Swiss uh, investments and foreign investments. And that means that we often in those um, uh, pension investments, we see very, very strong allocations into Switzerland. And with strong allocation, I mean, when we talk about this global portfolio, that global market capitalization that um, uh, Stefan has presented, Switzerland would be 2% of the global, like, the, the, the global basket, right? And uh, there we often see allocations of like 60, 70, 80% into Switzerland. That means pretty much everybody that has pension investments often is already invested to a very big extent into Switzerland, but probably even too much. So I think it does make sense also from a risk perspective to not only invest in Switzerland and to additionally to your um, pension investment in the, in the private investments where you can um, be invested yourself to go broader um, and outside of our country. Um, uh, you have your job here, you have your pension investments here, you might be invested here privately. So to, to go broader, to also not have this bullet risk in, in one, uh, one country. And even go broader also with the asset classes, right? Not only investing to stocks, but we come to that. But we said uh, also have a certain part into um, precious metals. Actually, precious metals, that's what the richest families um, on earth do, what the big uh, um, family offices do. Uh, they have a, a certain part of their uh, investments into um in, into gold and silver. Also, our gold and silver is actually held in Switzerland in the vaults of ZKB and UBS. So, so, so basically, to have this, like, if everything goes wrong, you kind of have this one part of the asset allocation that really brings uh, brings in this um, stability. But um, let's go further. And now. Um, Another comparison here that's also 10 years back. So what we have uh, looked at now, because also many of our clients, they don't have a full equity portfolio. Equity, um, uh, you have explained that, uh, Thomas, that needs a certain um, risk uh, ability also as well, because it, it basically also goes up and down more. What you can see here that um, uh, we have compared a portfolio that is full global equity with a portfolio that has the bonds. So um, we would expect the bond uh, portfolio to return less. That's that's true, but also to be more stable. What we really can also see on this chart in the yellow line in the last um, uh, uh, two to three years is this impact of the interest rate uh, that uh, Thomas has described. So that really the, the bond prices have um, taken a hit and that has not fully recovered because what needs to happen now is that on those bonds, you also need to cash in on the higher interest rate you 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 have got now. So in the, in the next years, you're just going to earn more on this and over the long run, this is going to compensate uh, the hit you have um, uh, taken potentially uh, on uh, on on the price. Uh, yeah, we, we talked about diversification. I think like actually also going forward that um, the bonds they do have dependent on what um, your risk ability, your risk willingness is uh, um, uh, a good impact on the diversification. Uh, a good impact on steering uh, steering your portfolio and now we go to uh, i think it's my um uh favorite slide i call it uh, the fruit salad i think it's a uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it illustrates, it, it, it looks like a, <laughs> a total mess, but it illustrates the power of diversification. First, I'm going to um, uh, show what we are seeing here, right? So um, on the left, that's basically in a standard portfolio of Selma, that's the different products or the different investments that would be included, uh, included here. And what we can see, there is nothing that is like standard, that is like just green. 
So there is nothing that is like um, uh, always, always positive. And also you can see how it changes um, uh, in terms of what is the best investment and what is the worst investment. So um, let's go to your question about, okay, Switzerland, right? Um, um, and that's the, uh, in, the, in the bottom, the UBS um, SPI that stands for uh, Swiss Performance Index, that's a representation of the Swiss market. And you can see if you look at September 23, um, that Switzerland basically has be, been one of the worst markets here. So silver has been worse, but Switzerland has been from the from the equity markets, the, the worst performing market that uh, basically we look at. When you go back to, to April, you can see that has been the best. So that's also why this like this gap has been opening and been closing, uh, uh, closing again. But you can see that there is nothing that is like consistently good and consistently um, bad here. And uh, what what Steph um, has explained, right? So I, I think it's it's almost we, nobody has this um, uh, magic uh, magic mirror or magic bowl where you can look into and you're gonna see what is gonna be good uh, next uh, next month. Otherwise, we would probably be sitting uh, on the Bahamas and drinking cocktails or like <laughs> some somewhere else and not doing a webinar in the evening. But what you can do is that you can look at all those asset classes combined and you can have a, a very very high probability of reaching a long-term uh, return of here uh, dependent on how you mix those different things of four and a half uh, from four and a half uh, to six percent over the long run and there uh, we, we do get a high confidence that mixing all those fruits and these fruit salads over different asset classes, over different years. That's also important. This includes different years. We've seen that in the past. It includes very positive years like 2021, where um, markets have been going up 15%, uh, like very negative years like 2022, where markets have been going down 17, 18%. Um, and then years like 2023 that are very mixed, where we don't know what's going to be the result. And then when you look at all those years in the um, uh, going going back, I'm going to go back to, to, to this, you can see that there is a positive tendency over, uh, over time and that all those um, uh, basically individual fruits in this fruit salad have added up to the return uh, over time. What many of our clients also do here uh, is that they invest a part of their income or part of their money every month. So basically they have not everything invested into like one, one, one single um, uh, point in time, like end of 2021, where it's not been very good, but they have invested many, many times along this, uh, along this chart. And that means of course that they get an average purchase price and that they have, um, uh, whenever markets go down, they have just bought at the cheaper price, uh, which um, then levels out the fluctuations uh, over uh, over time. So yes, from the fruit salad, I think I would give back then to um, uh, Thomas to give us some final tips and remarks before we close. Or um, maybe I can yes, maybe sorry I can jump in. Um, it also looks a bit like Greek salad. Yeah, that's true, I, yes, look. that's true. Um, but I just saw a question in the chat yes. and it's regarding the sustainable yes. portfolio you can have with Selma. So does this look similar looks um, pretty, and is there a difference? It looks pretty similar. So what we do is that we that the risk management, that the steering of the sustainable portfolio is, um, uh, is the same. So what we don't have as an example is we don't have private equity in the sustainable portfolio uh, because it's not uh, that there is... Uh, no product where we can mirror that as a class in a in a sustainable way but um what what we do is as i said from the risk management perspective we aim to um, generate the same returns we aim at the same cost for the sustainable uh, portfolio than we do um, here for this uh, standard portfolio so it does look pretty similar Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. So now, Thomas, sorry, I interrupted your start, but um, now you can start with all the tips you also give to our customers when they reach out to you um, in the chat or 
via email yeah, I'm trying calls. to do that first I'm impressed by the fruit salad of being a Greek Greek salad I'm I'm starting to get hungry I have to say when I hear all these examples <laughs> here so that's that's really nice but I think what it really depicts is uh, and this is also something that is often asked by our clients and what I'm trying to point out to them is that this diversification is so important so when you see all these lights there the red one the orange one the green one and it changes every month it jumps around and from here to there it's just a roller coaster it would make you crazy if you have to follow all this by yourself but then when you look at the result of it when you look at the result of that diversification is that actually it turns out to be a smooth return long term and this is the great thing about about diversification so that it's the best way to die to 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 balance your risks without having to compromise on long-term returns this is the this is the beauty of diversification the beauty of the fruit salad so every time i'm eating a fruit salad now in the future i will remember that example of patrick <laughs> it's really nice so what is also very important is what we often tell our clients and uh, maybe some of you heard that already it's like it's important to have a plan. What, what Stefan also outlined, it's very important to sit down, think yourself, uh, what is my plan when I invest? And when you plan, you should not plan as with other things in life. Don't plan for one week, don't plan for one month, plan for years, do plan for decades. Have a look, what is my financial ability? What can I put aside on a monthly basis? How much money should I keep on my, cash, uh, on, on my own bank account as cash? But money that can be and that you assume can remain invested long term, yes, that should be invested. Do not invest it at once. Come up with a plan. Selma can help you there in uh, having a plan how to, do, how to invest money over time. And once you have that plan, stick to that plan. That is also very important. Not to get disturbed by the short term ups and downs that can always happen, but think long term. No. And I think Thomas, sorry, you shared like a great anecdote during like our yeah, preparation. Yeah, I remember that. Okay, yes, and maybe you I remember can... that. Yeah, but it's again... from the beginning of my professional life. I started as a stockbroker actually in 1996, and uh, I remember when the market uh, was strong, but then it got really nervous because of one comment by one person. Actually, it was a very, it was a very influential person. It was the president of the of the Fed, so of the uh, of the central bank of the United States, so one of the most important person in the financial industry, actually. And he actually came out with a speech, and in that speech, he said he, he talked about the irrational exuberance of investors. So irrational exuberance. What he meant is that. People are getting too excited about investing uh, and markets have gone up too far in his words. Uh, it, the, the prices should correct. This actually also was what happened. So people got a little bit scared uh, and, uh, and people sold, uh, markets went down and so forth. Now, looking back, looking back 25 years, should I have been concerned back then by what is going on short term? No. I should not have. Actually, I should have just stick to my plan. I should have continued to invest. Back then, the Dow Jones, the index in the US was about 8,000 points. Now it's at 34,000 points. So it just indicates to you that over time, things tend to recover and you should not get distracted uh, by, by, by what is happening uh, uh, short term. Although sometimes it's emotionally a little bit difficult. But emotions are a bad advisor when it comes to investing. This again, think long term. Time is on your side. The longer your money can remain invested, the more compound interest. So this snowball effect that money starts to work on your behalf, the, the stronger that, that becomes, the longer money can, uh, can uh, remain invested. And again, remember the fruit salad, invest in a broadly and diversified, in a broadly diversified portfolio do also invest regularly regular investments help you to better balance out those short-term ups and downs remember when you remember when you invest regularly not all your money at once do it do it steadily do it for example monthly then you tend to, to to balance out those ups and downs you buy at different prices and this might also help once the markets recover to to benefit even stronger from the from the recovery 
perfect so um almost finished on time <laughs> i'd say um thank you patrick stefan and thomas and um, i've learned a lot myself and i believe i'm not the only one and then um, of course also a big thank you to all um of you uh, who have participated this webinar we were super happy to see so many of you here and then um, your questions will be answered in the upcoming days um, when they're not answered yet in the chat from Niklas. So also thank you to Niklas for being in the chat. And then in case you have feedback for us um, about how you like the webinar or also um, what topic would be interesting for a next webinar, please let us know in the chat or via email. We're always happy to pick this up. And yeah, from my side, everyone have a nice evening and good Greek salad or good thank dinner. You. Thanks, Thank everybody. You, everybody. Have a nice evening. Bye bye. Have a nice evening. Bye bye. Bye bye.